for much of human history, we were kind of like the LLMs, figuring things out by kind of matching patterns in our minds. But then came more systematic formalization and eventually computation. And with that, we got a whole other level of power to truly create new things and to, in effect, go wherever we want in the Ruliad. But the challenge is to do that in a way that connects with what we humans and our AIs understand. You know, I, I know that you make a, a big thing about the way that we measure and observe the universe rests upon that sort of notion of things having temporal persistence. I, I guess that the same kind of commitment is inherent in assuming that there is a non-equilibrium steady state solution to the dynamics that, you know, in, in, a classical, uh, in a classical formulation. Human language, mathematics, logic, these are all ways to formalize the world. And in our century, there's a new and yet more powerful one, computation. For nearly 50 years, I've had the great privilege of building up an ever taller tower of science and technology that's based on that idea of computation. Is this a fact of physics, that the world is predictable enough mm. that an observer who can sort of continue to exist is possible? I mean, this is something which I think from, from my understanding of, of fundamental physics, one of the things that is not obvious is that an observer who persists in time is possible in the universe. And that, that very existence, the emergence of an observer is would manifest to us and indeed does manifest to us as a kind of intelligence a kind of sentience that may or may not have some kind of deep planning uh, associated with it i i've been interested in in trying to characterize what our observers like us like and the the thing in our physics project that's really the the kind of the the sort of uh, motivation for that is that there is this thing we call the Rouliad, this kind of entangled limit of all possible computations, which is in a sense has everything in it. For me, two critical features of observers like us are that we are computationally bounded, we have sort of only finite minds, we can't untangle every detail of what might be happening in the universe, we can only look at sort of aggregated, uh, large-scale features. So computation isn't just a possible formalization, it's the ultimate one for our universe. It all starts from the idea that space, like matter, is made of discrete elements. And from that uh, structure of space and everything in it, it it's, it's defined just by a network of relations between these elements that we might call atoms of space. So it's all very elegant, but deeply abstract. But here's kind of a humanized representation, a version of the very beginning of the universe. And what we're seeing here is the emergence of space and everything in it by the successive application of very simple computational rules. And remember, these dots are not atoms in any existing space, they're atoms of space that get put together to make space. The observer thinks they're standing still. The observer is not zipping around all over the place. The observer believes they're stuck. They're persistent in time and they're stuck in more or less the same place in space. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to make a video that anybody recognizes, even though the underlying connections in, the, in all these hypergraphs are, are all absolutely correct. We just wouldn't be able to see that. So it, it's a, um, so in that sense, uh, you know, we can say that to an observer with those characteristics, yes, black holes are persistent things. And yes, if we kept going long enough, we could build our whole universe this way. So eons later, here's a chunk of space with two little black holes that uh, if we wait a little while, will eventually merge, uh, generating little ripples of gravitational radiation. And remember, all of this is built from pure computation. But like fluid mechanics emerging from molecules, what emerges here is space-time and Einstein's equations for gravity. Our computational rules can inevitably be applied in many ways, uh, each defining a different kind of thread of time, a different path of history that can branch and merge. But as observers embedded in this universe, we're branching and merging too. And it turns out that quantum mechanics emerges as the story of how branching minds perceive a branching universe.
So the little pink lines you might be able to see here show the structure of what we call branchial space, the space of quantum branches. And one of the stunningly beautiful things, at least for physicists like me, is that the same phenomenon that in physical space gives us gravity, in branchial space gives us quantum mechanics. So in the history of science so far, I think we can identify sort of four broad paradigms for making models of the world that can be distinguished kind of by how they deal with time. So in antiquity, and in plenty of areas of science even today, it's all about kind of what are things made of, and time doesn't really enter. But in the 1600s came the idea of modeling things with mathematical formulas in which time enters, but basically just as a coordinate value. Then in the 1980s, and this is something in which I was deeply involved, came the idea of making models uh, by starting with simple computational rules and just letting them run. So can one predict what will happen? No. There's what I call computational irreducibility, in which, in effect, the passage of time corresponds to an irreducible computation that we have to run in order to work out how it will turn out. But now there's kind of something, something even more in our physics project, there's things have become multi-computational with many threads of time that can only knitted, be knitted together by an observer. I'm, I'm, I'm remembering when I was like 15 years old or something, maybe 14 years old or something, I went to some talk by some well-known physicist uh, and you know, I, I sort of said, well, you know, they were talking about black holes and I was like, is there something you know, similar between electrons and black holes? And it was like, no, 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 that's a completely silly idea. You, know, you should forget that idea. So you know, I talked about building up the universe by repeatedly applying a computational rule. But how is that rule picked? Well, actually, it isn't, because all possible rules are used. And we're building up what I call the ruliad, the kind of deeply abstract but unique object that is the entangled limit of all possible computational processes. Here's a, a tiny fragment of it shown in terms of Turing machines. So this, this ruliad is everything. And we as observers are necessarily part of it. In the ruliad as a whole, in a sense, everything computationally possible can happen. But observers like us just sample specific slices of the ruliad. And there are two crucial facts about us. First, we're computationally bounded. Our minds are limited. And second, we believe we're persistent in time, even though we're made of different atoms of space at every moment. So then, here's the big result. What observers with those characteristics perceive in the Rouliad necessarily follows certain laws, and those laws turn out to be precisely the three key theories of 20th century physics, general relativity, quantum mechanics, and statistical mechanics and the second law. So it's because we're observers like us that we perceive the laws of physics we do. We can think of sort of different minds as being at different places in ruleal space. Human minds who think alike are nearby, animals further away, and further out we get to kind of alien minds where it's hard to make a translation. I would suspect that there is something which you are, something interesting which you're effectively taking as axiomatic about observers and, and perhaps, perhaps some uh, that, uh, I mean, in a sense, one of the things I'm trying to do right now is to think about what aspects of observers are in fact there, but we've always thought they were obvious. And one of the things that's really dramatic in that simulation is how much activity there is in the background of space. That is, that space, in order to exist, has to have a lot of activity just to knit together the different pieces of space. Could we think our way out of it? I think we possibly could, in a sort of um, science fiction sense, simply because we've got the right kinds of models of our lived world, which is just the physics that you're talking about. But lots of other observers would not be able to do that unless they had that right kind of internal model, that implicit um, way of modelling the causes of uh, all of my sensations. I mean, I think you were talking about thinginess, so to speak, which is a lower bar probably than observerness. I mean, thinginess might yes. just be yes. the ability to maintain an independent object, maintain something that we can consider to be a persistent object. Yeah. This is Chris Fields. Chris Fields. Yes. And so he, he um, frames exactly what um, you were just saying in terms of there being little pockets of concentrated planning, sort of, um, sort of self-modeling of the kind that it, 
invokes the consequences of one's own agent. He'd articulate that in terms of a minimal Markov blanket. Yeah. So something that cannot be reduced, that has, if you like, the capacity to be an agent, and then it sees itself enacting its plans through a hierarchy of subsequent Markov blankets. So you could say that the, you know, the inclusive Markov blanket around this little packet or, or min, uh, irreducible Markov blanket was an agent, but the agency sits at the heart, and, and of course he thinks that's consciousness. You're both absolutely brilliant, and I think Tim and I both look up to you quite a bit. So this is actually a pretty terrifying situation for me. <laughs> you know, uh, well, let's see, let's see what happens here. Of, you know. <laughs> so look, there's there's no real way to uh, to order two of one's heroes. So I just I just went to the tried and true alphabetical. So we're just gonna we're gonna introduce uh, Dr. Friston and then Dr. Wolfram. So. Dr. Friston, welcome back to the show. You are an esteemed British scientist who is widely recognized for groundbreaking quantitative uh, methods to understand the human brain. A professor at the Institute of Neurology, University College London, Friston invented statistical parametric mapping and voxel-based morphometry, two neuroimaging techniques that have revolutionized the field. Dr. Friston, has published over a thousand papers in scientific journals, making him one of the most cited scientists. He is the originator of dynamic causal modeling and the much acclaimed free energy principle, a deceptively simple and yet profoundly impactful idea that has fundamentally reshaped our understanding of the brain and living systems. More recently, he accepted a role as chief scientist at Versus AI, a company implementing cognitive computing and distributed intelligence. Welcome back to the show. It's great to be here. And can I just say it's a great honor to be here with uh, Stephen Wolfram. We've, I don't think we've ever actually met and it's, it's lovely to see you. And very nice to meet you too. Yeah, and Dr. Stephen Wolfram, you are a renowned British American computer scientist, physicist and business leader known for your considerable contributions to multiple scientific domains. As the founder and CEO of the innovative software company Wolfram Research, he developed Mathematica, a comprehensive computation environment, along with the Wolfram language, an original symbolic language that greatly alters the interaction with computation. As an early pioneer in theoretical physics, cellular automata, and complexity theory, he wrote the best-selling book, a new kind of science, arguing for a fundamental shift in scientific paradigms. More recently, he launched the Wolfram Physics Project, ambitiously aspiring to build up a fundamental theory of all physics from a computational foundation. For his influential work, he has achieved numerous accolades, including being the youngest MacArthur Fellowship winner. Wolfram's transformative approach continues to impact the landscape of computational science and beyond. And welcome back to the show. You've been on a few times with us now. Yes, great, great to be back. And this is, you know, I, I have been meaning to learn what does Carl Friston really do? So this is my opportunity to, to do that. So I'm looking forward to this. And uh, uh, am I allowed to just jump in and start talking about science? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, of course. So, Please so do. I, I've been, I'm, I'm sort of, curious how horribly wrong I am in my sort of uh, uh, vague idea of, of, uh, of, of Carl and his free energy principle and so on. So, so Steve, let me, let me try my version of this, and then you can tell me what's, what's horribly wrong with it. Um, I mean, it's kind of like if you're a, a brain-like thing, you kind of, the, the concept, I think, is that you want the world to be as predictable a place as possible and that it can be predictable either because you have a great model of what's going to happen or because you've organized your world so that it is set up to be predictable. You know, we, 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 um, uh, we kind of, uh, uh, you know, part of what we try to achieve with technology and things is to make our lives sort of, uh, um, uh, more predictable, and I suppose my my assumption is that 
I mean, I, first of all, am I, am I roughly right in what the, what the point is here? Am I totally, totally off base? No, no, you're, you're perfectly right. I mean, it's, that's almost um, word for word how, how I would portray the sort of teleological implications of the free energy principle to psychologists and neurobiologists and other sort of theoreticians in, in the life sciences. I should say if I was talking to a physicist, and now I am, and just want to um, say that I'm only an intuitive physicist. Uh, you know, I've forgotten all the physics I did um, when, I was, with, when, I, when I was a young man. But if I were trying to explain to a physicist, um, then everything you said is exactly right, but inverted. Um, so if things exist and thingness is defined in terms of establishing some kind of synchrony or some kind of non-equilibrium steady state with everything else, or particularly the, the local niche in which it finds itself, then it can always be read as if it is trying to predict what is happening and exactly as you say, engineer or design its niche so to, as to make things more predictable. So it's one of Dan Dennett's strange inversions. So part of the simplicity of the, um, the free energy principle lies in that um, almost tautological um, framing of the free energy principle, whereby you're just saying that if something exists in harmony um, 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 in relation to its environment, then it will show these kinds of properties that can, on a, on a certain reading, be interpreted as minimizing surprise, maximizing predictability. But there are lots of nuances, and and, and I would like to know you know, how this might fit into um, what we were talking about before going on air, you know, the Rouliad and your conception of, the, you know, how the universe unfolds and what part of that, what slice of that constitutes the thing, the observer, and how it relates to, you know, the context in which it, in which it is it, it, it is evolving. Yeah, I think that's, that's interesting. But let, let me see if I can paraphrase what you just said. You, you basically said that for an organism to be sort of happily going along, as you said, in harmony with its environment, it is inevitable, you say, that it must have achieved this minimization of surprise, this maximization of predictability. Is that, is that right? I mean, that, that's some... Um, uh, so, so in other words, that, that somehow, um, if, if things were still dynamically changing and you know, the world was becoming a different place, for example, and equilibrium of the type you described had not been achieved, then, as I understand it, you would not expect your, your sort of, uh, uh, well, I, 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 I kind of, the, the term free energy uh, kind of confuses me a bit because, you know, I'm, I'm used to kind of a physics version of that, which I think is not quite the same as what you're talking about. But let's say um, your uh, let's, let's talk about, you're saying that, so let, let me ask, in a, in a situation where the world is changing, do you anticipate that this minimization of surprise, so to speak, still is still there? Or do you think there's a, a different thing that might be more like a, a non-equilibrium version of thermodynamics as compared to a sort of equilibrium uh, things are going along with, with uh, in, in the case of thermodynamics, maximization of entropy, in, in your case, a minimization of surprise? Or, or did I misunderstand that? Well, no, that's, that's an excellent question. So, strictly speaking, the free energy principle does assume that there is some steady state, but it, it is a non equilibrium steady state. So, it certainly is um, meant to speak to 21st century physics and not the, um, the, thermodynamic equilibria that you would have in, in, say, a closed system. So it's all about how something, say, an observer, is open to the thing that it is, it is observing and understanding um, the statistics of that exchange with the thing that is, it is open, say, for example, a heat bath. It's understanding how you couple to a heat bath and beyond and what certain properties would um, that coupling and the system say the observer of that heat bath would possess if it were the case technically that this um, joint system had a pullback attractor so it's largely framed around the notion of random dynamical systems 
but it does assume that there exists a pullback attractor to which the system is being attracted. Um, so most of the um, most of the free energy principle would really only apply over the time scale that you are circulating on that attracting set. So if at a certain time scale there would could be um, reasonably assumed over a period of time uh, an unequilibrium steady state, then you can apply the, the free energy principle. So uh, that you know, at that level, it, there are assumptions about persistence. Um, and you know, I, I know that you make a, a big thing about the way that we measure and observe the universe rests upon that sort of notion of things having temporal persistence. I, I guess that the same kind of commitment is inherent in assuming that there is a non-equilibrium steady state solution to the dynamics that you're in, in, in a classical uh, in a classical formulation. So, so, so I mean, you're you're really talking about if the world isn't changing too much, this is what brains and things like them are going to be trying to achieve. That is, they're going to be trying to set things up so that they can, you know, as as well as possible, predict what's going to happen. So I'm I'm kind of curious whether you see that as being an inevitable feature of sort of our success and the struggle for life in biological evolution, and whether you think it's kind of almost a corollary to uh, kind of a a a a, a brain oriented corollary to sort of success in natural selection, or whether you think it has a different kind of origin. Um, I would look at natural selection as one manifestation of exactly the same kind of self-organization but at a much slower time scale so um success just is existing and existing is um maintaining yourself in some characteristic states so that you can be identified as that kind of thing over a certain time period so if that is success then um the free energy principle is just uh, describing the necessary properties from the point of view of, of sort of a classical physicist or at least somebody uh, um, framing things in terms of um, random dynamical systems. Success just is existing for or persisting for a sufficient amount of time. And that could be um, at a time scale uh, suitable to understand um, the organization of a single cell so that the persistence would actually you know possibly be in hours to weeks to months or it could be a, the kind of persistence you might bring to the table to characterize or define the characteristic coarse grain states that apply to a particular species for example and then you'd be looking at evolution as a process of um effectively finding those phenotypes that persist um, there's a lot of tautologies here, which perhaps if you just indulge me. So the surprise we're talking about is just the self-information in a Shannon-esque sense. That's just a negative log probability of you know me as something um, being in a, in a particular state. So in minimizing that self-information, I'm also implicitly maximizing the probability of me occupying this particular state. So I'm just maximizing my marginal likelihood, having marginalized out all the environmental or external causes of the exchange with the environment. So read in that way, it's just, a, uh, you could also say it is a statement of adaptive fitness at an evolutionary set, uh, in an evolutionary sense that it is a measure of the probability you'll find something like me in this particular eco niche. So then you can now start to read evolution, natural selection as Bayesian model selection in the sense that um, a Bayesian statistician would just select the best hypothesis or the best model of her data on the basis of the marginal likelihood or the evidence for that model. So that leads to a nice picture of evolution as effectively um, nature's way of doing Bayesian model selection, trying to get the right kind of model for this kind of eco niche. I mean, clearly things get a little bit more complicated when the the model is starting to build that eco niche. But in essence, that you know that that's a sort of um, the deflationary aspect of this description. You know, it's just but, yeah. But but I mean, so I'm kind of curious. In in an, an organism, it's trying to make its world as predictable as possible by, by getting smarter as an organism and by uh, 
giving itself you know, an easier house to live in, where it doesn't have to be subject to the vicissitudes of nature, so to speak, where it can, it can just, uh, uh, you know, have a predictable life. But I suppose, you know, maybe it seems very kind of um, uh, sort of everyday to say, I mean, uh, if th that's kind of like you're setting things up to make things as status quo as possible, because that's that's the case in which things will be as as predictable as possible. But yet, some of us, perhaps even like you and me, like going to explore things where we don't kind of know what's going to happen. And uh, so I'm, I'm sort of curious how you see kind of unexpected scientific discovery in the context of kind of a, a model of what what, in a sense, brains try to achieve in, in so far as you, you're, you're positing that uh, sort of things should be set up to be as predictable as possible, how does kind of going out and finding surprising things in, in science or in nature fit, fit into that? I'm, I'm sort of curious. Right. Well, it's interesting you end the question with curious because that, that, that would be the answer, wouldn't it? You know, uh, how would you explain us as curious creatures? So from... Yep. From the the physicist's point of view, um, this rests um, on the um, the picture of the free energy principle as simply a, a, a principle of least action. So it's it's um, um, you know there is some time integral in play, uh, exactly of the kind that sort of Richard Feynman. And just to explain where the free energy comes from, in this sense, it, it is exactly the kind of free energy that Richard Feynman used to. Um, is elude the intractable problem of marginalizing over all possible paths, but providing a, a variational bound on that marginal, uh, that marginal or the log of the uh, the marginal likelihood, uh, which has been used to great effect in statistics, um, and indeed, um, you know, defines a whole field of variational bays. So it, it is purely um, an information theoretic probabilistic quantity that bounds the, the the marginal likelihood but crucially um it applies to trajectories and paths so i think that's the solution to your um i think very natural and challenging question why is it if we are surprise minimizing we act in a way that is um information seeking well, uh, that responds to novelty to responds to sensation and indeed as you say you know, both and I, you and I now are engaging in this sort of uncertainty res resolving, curiosity driven kind of behavior. And one could also cast both our lives as doing exactly this and our, and Keith and Tim. <laughs> That's the whole raison d'etre of, the, of, these, of these interviews. It's to um, gain information, you know, um, celebrate information seeking behavior. Um, the, you know, the, the narrative answer to your question that if you're trying to minimize surprise and you want to use that principle to understand the kinds of paths that I would choose or elect to take through some state space, then I'm going to try to choose those, or I am more likely to choose those paths that minimize expected surprise. Now, if you remember, expected surprise is just expected self-information, so that's just uncertainty. So entropy. So I will, ch oh, in terms of the paths that I take, in terms of my behavior, my choices, and my actions over time, then I am more likely to choose those actions that reduce uh, the entropy of my beliefs or my measurements, namely reduce my uncertainty. So that's, that, that is, if you like, the kernel of the application of the free energy principle not just the states of mind, but to the way that one can understand agency in the sense of, you know, how do um, sentient things or things that could be cast as, or as observing in some sense, how do they behave or how must they behave if they, on average, minimize the path integral of their surprise or the bound of, a bound upon surprise? So red light that it is just a statement, it's just a, a, you know, a variational principle of least action that now acquires an interpretation uh, that you end up saying, well, I am then, if I exist, and I am an agent that, that can act upon that world and can gather the right kind of data or sample the right 
the right um, sensory inputs or sensory exchanges with that world, then it will look as if I am curious. And you know, pr perhaps you know, we, um, mankind or womankind, is you know the epitome of that kind of self-organizing realization of that principle of, of least action. Does that so make I'm sense? I'm not quite understanding this. So I, I mean, in in uh, uh, in the traditional path integral of physics, one has what one is trying to minimize is the action effectively the relativistically invariant uh, kind of um, uh, energy uh, quantity and when, when specifically one's trying to you know uh, find well actually it's not necessarily minimized find the extrema of e to the i times the action where so uh, uh, you, you're I mean you know there's a there's a there's a fairly specific uh, kind of concept in physics of, of how that works that rather spectacularly in our kind of models of fundamental physics we can actually derive from much lower level computational concepts but I think that's not really where you're going with what you're thinking about I think instead what you're thinking about is you have a, a path integral of if, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, you, you're saying there is sort of the life of the organism is the, the the time variable and the life of the organism is what you're integrating over, and the possible paths correspond to the possible things the organism could do somehow navigating through what is some kind of distribution space of of, of probabilities. Um, is is that roughly right, or did I did I totally misunderstand that? No, I, no, I, I think it is certainly r roughly right. I, I, the rightness there is that you know, w well, first of all, um, the sort of formal, the pathological formulation of the free energy principle is it is just exactly finding that path that that minimizes that that um, the integral of the um, this variational free energy. But you are also right that the variational free energy is a functional of a probability distribution. So the twist here is that the physical states of an observer that is somehow identifiable or individuate or separable from the thing that is that is uh, being observed stand in for the sufficient statistics or the parameters of probability distributions, conditional probability distributions, you know, um, interpreted or read as Bayesian beliefs of a very subpersonal sort. So this free energy is a function of a function. It's a function of probability distributions that are parameterized by the physical paths that your internal states, internal to the observer, would take. And then so, the game is to try and find, or um, for certain particles that have very, very precise internal dynamics, they will follow the paths of least action in a standard classical physics sense. Um, but in this instance, you would be interpreting that as um, um, paths that are um, described in terms of the smallest variational free energy functional of the beliefs encoded by those paths. So if, those, um, if that free energy is now read uh, in terms of uh, a measure of or a representation of the internal states, sorry, the external states, um, then what you're saying is that this, this path of least action is effectively the path of least surprise about what you think is actually causing the your your exchange with the external states. So the, the twist here is that your your work you're making a distinction. Well, the move from say um, physics or the move which makes the uh, the physics that um, is described by the free energy principle distinct from the usual applications of, of, of the path integral formulation is that you've got a distinction between the states and observer and that which is observed, which now allows it or licenses you um, to interpret the observing states as holding beliefs about the observed states. So um, under, you know, w w what we um, would normally call a sort of Markov blanket partition, where you're partitioning the 
uh, all possible states into the states of the thing doing the observation and the thing and the external states being um, being observed. What you're saying is that the internal states now play the role of the sufficient statistics of beliefs or distributions about the external states. So these are beliefs about something. They're not the probability distribution of the thing itself, which is you know what you would apply or. Um, how you deploy the principle, deploy the principle of least action uh, in the usual sense, but it's the same, exactly the same math, but now applied to the the conditional distributions or the Bayesian beliefs encoded by or entailed by the internal states. So this is where the sort of the physics of sentience comes in, and you can start to talk about being surprised, you know, in an anthropomorphic sense. Um, but the maths is is you know there's there's nothing new in the maths. It's just it's just um, what inherits from being able to distinguish between the inside and and the outside. Does that make sense? So you're well, moving on. Let a... me see if I understand that. So so let's take a, a sort of an initial simplified model where we don't consider the internal states of the observer at all. Let's just start with an observer hanging out in an environment and uh, choosing a path through in a sense, through that environment. So imagine that the environment is parameterized by, let's say, an, an information amount or an entropy. The, the, the environment is parameterized by different, let, let's say we've just got a plane, XY plane, for example, and at every point in the XY plane, we have a certain amount of randomness. Some places in the XY plane are very predictable. We can just, you know, there's a road that's just very well defined. And if we go off the road, we're in this kind of billowing area where all kinds of random things are happening. So my understanding would be that, that in your principle, if we don't start talking about the internal states of the observer, that what your principle would say is follow the road. Follow the thing that's predictable. Don't go off into those billowing um, outside areas where there's much more randomness in, in, the, uh, in the behavior. I mean, that would be, if I understand correctly, and that would sort of minimize, that would make things as predictable as possible because you're just going down the road. You're not, uh, you're not subjecting yourself to the, to, the, to the other randomness in the environment. So we start with that. Now you start to say, well, I don't just want to talk about the external environment. I want to talk about also the internal states of the observer and how the observer builds up some view of the environment um, and and builds up their own model of what's going on, and let me see if I can untangle that. I mean, so so first of all, am I am I more or less right in terms of thinking about in the pure fixed observer external environment, the observer will pick the predictable road, not the unpredictable areas of randomness. Is is that is that kind of the right intuition or? Well, I wonder if if I can just jump in here for a second, if you don't mind, and and kind of formulate. Because I've been thinking about this a lot, you know, since we've been talking to you, uh, Professor Friston, and I think this road, right? So we have this two D landscape, and there's there's really a narrow path. I think is is the idea because hey, the universe is complicated, life is complicated. There's lots of fire and brimstone, you know, kind of all over the place, and really, the path that leads to you continuing to exist is quite a narrow needle that you need to thread. And if I understand correctly. In order to thread that needle, in order to even stay on the path, you have to be able to model the landscape a bit, at least sufficiently well that you can stay on the path because most actions actually lead you off into the, the billowing chaotic area where you're likely to say, have your cell membrane disrupted, you know, if you're, if you're a cell. And so that, therefore, if you're going to continue to stay on this path of, of survival, you must in some way at least partly sufficiently well enough model this landscape in order to stay on the path. Is this, is this correct? I, I think to me that, that, that sounds like a clear way to think about it given, I mean, particularly if the landscape is changing, then it is necessary, then, then some purely inertial activity of just, I'm gonna keep going in a straight line, isn't going to cut it. And you know, so that sort of necessitates some kind of internal uh, you know, learning on the part of the observer. I mean, I, the and, and I, I suppose in the, in this thinking about so, what attributes does the observer have to have so that um, 
so that it can be successful. For example, would you imagine that if the world was too unpredictable a place, if physics was, I mean, is this a fact of physics that the world is predictable enough mm. that an observer who can sort of continue to exist is possible? I mean, this is something which I think from, from my understanding of, of fundamental physics, one of the things that is not obvious is that an observer who persists in time is possible in the universe. That's mm -hmm. almost an assumption of uh, kind of the way that one can derive the laws of physics that we see from sort of underlying computational foundations, is that it is possible to have an observer who persists in time. So I'm, I'm curious with, 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 with your setup, uh, Carl, what, what um, uh, you know, could you imagine a world in which the, uh, you, I mean, you might say, well, whatever the world is like, there's always going to be something which follows this minimum principle of, uh, of, of minimizing, maximizing predictability. But, you know, maybe there is, maybe uh, there's a question of whether there could be a world in which you can never achieve a decent level of predictability. Um, and in which, I mean, perhaps there's a different thing to ask, which is, okay, you predict what's going to happen, but, I mean, for example, you know, the control system, the, the autopilot that's flying the plane can predict what's going to happen. But if there's a great big vacuum in the air, the plane is, is toast. You know, whatever prediction it might make, it might say, hey, I want to, you know, move the ailerons in this way and that way. But if the plane's just going to drop by 500 feet, it's going to be toast, whatever goes on. So I'm, I'm sort of curious what, uh, you know, do you imagine that there's some kind of limit to, you know, there's, there's some domain of controllability uh, that the world exists in a domain of controllability? Or do you think that there's sort of uh, that kind of a brain can learn anything, so to speak? Or, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm curious how you think about that. Um. I think that brains are very privileged and unique, and that I would imagine there are there are parts of the universe, or there are universes in which this kind of thing could not exist. Um, so I think that we're very rare things. Um, we have attained or um, some degree of um, non-equilibrium steady state with our particular environment, which I suspect is a, a very rare kind of um, occurrence. Um, and that that very existence, the emergence of an observer, is would manifest to us, and indeed does manifest to us as a kind of intelligence, a kind of sentience that may or may not have some kind of deep planning uh, associated with it. But these, I would imagine, are very rare instances. Um, and if I, mm. you know, had to qualify, why why are they so rare? Um, they, they depend upon a very, very um, sparse and structured dependencies amongst uh, amongst the states in question. And the states in question here would be the states of the the universe or the niche, and in particular the, the that subset of states that constitute the observer. So the observer cannot is you know um, very much as I imagine you know in the way you, in your physics project the the observer is part of the system so we just have a joint distribution over all possible states and there are certain patterns of interactions and certain states that you can associate with an observer in some very very rare instances and then under the free energy principle or at least for me the deep question then is well how do you then define that subset of states and in so doing can you say anything about the relationship between the subset of states that constitute the observer and the remaining states that are that are that are being observed? The only things you can say, well, let's put this another way. Um, so that puts pressure on the definition of the subset of states that constitute something or some some observer. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, you. Um, I end up or we end up um, saying, well, okay, we have to be able to um, identify the states of something um, in a way that allows us to disambiguate or not confuse it um, or not exchange it with the states of everything else. And that usually relies upon, in you know, um, in the classical formulation of the FEP, 
um, it relies upon specifying sparse coupling, sparse dependencies. So if one imagines um, um, you're some kind of universe where there um, there are lots of um, um, states um, or locations that can have occupy different states, then you're now talking about a, a universe that is es essentially, or parts of this universe that are essentially empty of connections. So you're resting upon the assumption that there are there are there exists pockets of the universe where there are sufficient sparsity of dependencies and, and neighborhood interactions that permit the emergence of this separation between, say, the inside of something and the outside of something. When that is in play, then the free energy principle uh, principle applies. Even our in our own universe, shortly after the Big Bang, we wouldn't expect there to be this type of, of life because the universe wasn't by that point sparse. Is that is that essentially what you're saying? I that's think so. what I think that's yeah. what's being said. I mean, I, I think I think that, you know, in a sense, what you're saying is the observer is a persistent thing. And in order to be persistent, it better not be being bashed too hard by things from the outside world. There better be some way in which the observer is only sparsely coupled to the outside world. So the observer can have a coherent identity that is persistent in some way. Now, obviously, there are things that are persistent. You know, your average little black hole is fairly persistent. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, so is your average electron or photon propagating through, through you know, through empty space, so to speak, or the vacuum, whatever that term, uh, which isn't that empty, Ether. actually. Um, but uh, uh, so, you know, th this, so I think, I think what, as I understand it, your notion of an observer, which, by the way, is, is kind of similar to my notion of an observer, would be that um, it is a thing which has a certain coherence and persistence, and it has certain internal states. And I think part of what you're describing is the way in which you know you have a, a, a more complicated feedback loop than perhaps uh, than I've really thought that much about a complicated feedback loop where the observer is kind of building their own world, both in terms of their model of what's happening in the outside world and the part of that outside world in which the observer is choosing to live. I mean, the observer is hanging out on the surface of the earth and isn't going and flying to the sun and, uh, you know, sticking themselves in a, um, in a, you know, 10 million degree furnace, so to speak. And um, that, and so there's, I mean, this question, first question, I suppose, is, and, and by the way, when it comes to physics, this question about persistence is, there's even more basic questions like, is pure motion possible? You know, what is motion? Motion is you've got a thing and it can move to other places. But it's not obvious that when you move the thing, that it is still the same thing. And that's something we're very familiar with because, but, you know, for example, if we lived near a space-time singularity, we might not even believe in pure motion because near a space-time singularity, your average, you know, coffee cup or something will be so distorted that it's not clear you would still identify it as that same coffee cup, so to speak. So I, I think in in um, uh, it's kind of the nature of of physics that we're used to is is one where it is possible to have pure motion. It's possible to have persistence at that level. But I think what you're, I mean, you know, what. I, I've been interested in, in trying to characterize what are observers like us like. And the, the thing in our physics project that's really the, the kind of the, the sort of uh, motivation for that is that there is this thing we call the Rouliad, this kind of entangled limit of all possible computations which is in a sense has everything in it. And to know what things we will perceive to actually be in the universe that we experience, we have to kind of know how we're going to be doing that experiencing. And that forces us to understand something about us as observers. 
And so it is interesting, quite interesting as far as I'm concerned, to try and get a better characterization of what observers like us are like. And I think for me, two critical features of observers like us are that we are computationally bounded, we have sort of only finite minds, we can't untangle every detail of what might be happening in the universe, we can only look at sort of aggregated uh, large-scale features, um, and uh, that's one thing. And the second thing is that we at least believe we're persistent in time. We believe that even though we might structurally be made from different atoms of space at successive moments of time, we, we can imagine that we have a persistent experience of the universe, so to speak. So I think what you're, uh, and, I, and I'm very, those two conditions are sufficient to allow us to derive second law of thermodynamics, general relativity, and quantum mechanics, which I think is absolutely spectacular because the fact that those things could be derivable from some underlying principle is, is really remarkable to me. But it's my suspicion that if we knew more about what we are inevitably like as observers, that we will be able to derive more of the way that, we, uh, that the universe seems to us. So for example, uh, something I was just realizing today, actually, in connection, we just had a lovely little simulation that we made of two little black holes in our model of space-time uh, merging. And one of the things that's really dramatic in that simulation is how much activity there is in the background of space. That is, that space, in order to exist, has to have a lot of activity just to knit together the different pieces of space, independent of having the black hole there. And that sort of, as, as one tries to think about what one is seeing in that video, one realizes that another thing about observers like us is we kind of believe that we are at a fixed place in space. It is not necessary that, in other words, in, in general relativity, for example, we could have a coordinate system where we're moving around all over the place in space. But one of the things that, again, is one of our assumptions, I think, implicit perhaps assumptions of observers like us, is that we think we're at a fixed place in space. I was kind of realizing that that's sort of why Copernicus was so shocking, so to speak, because you know we really did believe we were at a fixed place in space because that is our experience. And yet, you know, if, if the Earth's going around the sun, that can't really be what's actually happening in some sense. But, but I, I think, so what I'm trying to understand is in, in your sort of view of uh, kind of characteristics of observers, I think you're, you're describing sort of a more nuanced version of what an observer like us has to be like. And this kind of seeking of predictability is... It's an interesting idea. I mean, it, it's some, uh, and the question would be, you know, to what extent in this kind of, you know, unruly, ruly ad, so to speak, of all possible computations, that we are seeking the predictable paths or, or the predictable, uh, sort of seeking predictability in that is, is sort of an interesting principle. I mean, I, I suppose I'm curious if you look at it from the point of view of, uh, well, I, I think, as you say, it's a little bit tautological because, um, uh, you know, without predictability, if things are sufficiently unpredictable, you don't get to coherently exist. Mm -hmm. If things are sufficiently unpredictable, you will be torn apart by those outside forces that you cannot control, so to speak. Um, I, I am curious, uh, you know, when it comes to things like control theory, and you know the the whole sort of idea of uh, you know I mean control theory is a, is a much more limited way of thinking about what can you control. But I'm sort of curious. In um, I mean, if if I were to try to let's say my environment was uh, some well. How unpredictable an environment can I be in and still achieve enough control to be your kind of observer? I guess I, I would be curious if there's a characterization of just how unruly can the world be and still allow a, a coherent observer of the kind that you're, you're imagining. 
that's um yeah that's, that's a challenging question i, I you know, a superficial answer was not that unruly there has to be something uh, recognizable as time proceeds can i just say you, you you brought so many wonderful issues to the table there all of which i can see through the lens of my understanding of you know, much simpler and classical physics that, that, that um underwrites you know the, the free energy principle you know um just very briefly this um these two fundaments that that you mentioned the notion of computational boundedness plus persistence in time underwriting thingness and in particular you know the capacity to just observe or be an observer um for me um that is immediately reflected in the uh, the two pillars of the free energy principle which is first of all a markov boundary which is the thing that demarcates the observer from from the observed so it, i know that you were using bounded in a in a you know sort of bounded rationality possibly different or sense. competent yeah. yeah different sense but um you know i i still think it's quite beautiful that, that, that in fact the whole fep can just be written down from the statement there exists a markov boundary that separates the inside of a thing from the outside of a thing um and if can, you can i actually can i pick up on that for a second because i'm really curious about um you know to me for example our sensory organs are presumably there's a brain inside but it's connected only by certain sort of thin sensory organs to the outside world. And I guess that I'm curious because to me, what sensors, what our sensors and our measuring devices typically do is they take a large number of possible things that might be happening in the world. They equivalence a lot of those together. So we just get to say, I see a cat, mm -hmm. even though the details of the pixels in that cat might be very different. And I'm sort of curious, to the extent that you talk about this kind of Markov boundary, Markov blanket idea, um, to what extent is the, is the sparsification of external stimuli for that same reason? That is, that, that it seems like measuring devices or our sensors, you know, whatever, their big purpose is take all these different possible states of the world and equivalents lots of them together so that we can just make a simple summary. Is that consistent with your kind of view of how, how you get that sparsity of connection between the outside and the inside, so to speak? Or do you have a different point of view about that? No, no, I, I have exactly that point of view. And I'd even go further, you know, that all the internal machinations on the inside, which of course you will never see because it's hidden behind the Markov blanket, you observing the observer will only actually ever see the behavior, the active states of that Markov blanket, um, and the impression of the environment on that sensory epithelial or those sparse sensory sampling, those measurement tools. Um, but it, beyond that, the whole point, um, so one key way of reading the uh, maximization of marginal likelihood or the basically the, the the likelihood of these sensory impressions under a model of um what caused those um sensory um impressions that is under the hood um is to say you want the um the most accurate explanation that is as simple as possible so literally the you know the, the log marginal likelihood is equal to accuracy minus complexity so you're in the game of compression, you're in the game of coarse graining. That is an emergent property of maximizing the marginal likelihood of your sensory exchanges with with, with the observed. So um, this, I think, notion of coarse graining is absolutely central here at many, many different levels. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, um, well, that's that's what I want to ask about is because this is a connection that, that Tim and I have been thinking about to the being computationally bound. Is that if you're a computationally bound observer you necessarily must compress, even if your sensory organs could perceive every every particle within, you know, your exactly. uh, your, your light light cone, it still wouldn't do you any good because you don't have the computational capacity to compute, right? You you to compute all that. You only have a finite amount. So therefore you almost necessarily have to do something like the free energy principle because you've got to compress, which implies 
uncertainty and inaccuracy, and therefore you need to balance out how accurate can I be with the with the amount of computation that I can do, um, you know, with well, my my but, resources. But so there's a, there's a little bit of a difference here because you know you could imagine something where there's lots of randomness, which you just ignore for purposes of your sensory input. Mm. But I think what's being said about this free energy principle is that you're you're doing more than just ignoring it. You are actively trying to lead your life so as to minimize it, which is a different yes. thing. I mean, you could say, we're going to observe, uh, you know, there's, there's something happening in, I don't know, uh, uh, some, we're exposed to a cloud, let's say. We're exposed to all kinds of turbulence in the air. And we could say, you know, we're perfectly happy, we're, we're exposed to that, but the only thing we're going to pay attention to is something about how, you know, light travels through the air or something. But, but you're saying that, no, actually, we, our way of leading our lives, consistent with our continued existence, so to speak, is avoid that turbulence. Go and, you know, go and, you know, Go and fly through sort of uh, uh, unturbulent still air, so to speak, so that we avoid the places where we are going to be challenged by not knowing what's going to happen. So I, th I think you're 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 going beyond just saying we sort of throw away uh, we throw away information. You're saying we actively seek to build a world or to uh, to organize ourselves to live in a world where uh, where things are as predictable as possible. And, and as we were saying, I mean, you know, there might come a time when sort of things become deeply unpredictable and where there isn't, an, and I assume that, that, I don't know whether this is included in your model, but, you know, if suddenly something very different happened, if suddenly, you know, the earth went near a black hole or something and all kinds of crazy things started happening and, and we don't know what's going on. There's presumably, even the process of figuring out what should we do is, is one that could take us a while. And I don't know whether that's accounted for in your, in your kind of model of things. I mean, to say we go to the, the thing that minimizes our surprise, maximizes our predictability, it still could be, there could be a non-equilibrium phase in which we don't even know, it's very hard for us to work out what will be the most predictable path, so to speak. Yeah, radical um, uncertainty, if you're a, an economist. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you're bringing, again, so many issues uh, for, it's difficult to know what, what to pick up on. But um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, you're getting me to think, you know, this is, uh, you're getting me to do the thing that is uh, <laughs> precisely seems to be moving away from the predictable path. But, but right. please, please go on. Well, but it's but, much but, more fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in fact, let, let's just um, take that phrase, moving away from the predictable path, um, because it's got moving in. And I think that's quite crucial. So, you know, one could, um, I, and I, I have to confess, I'm using um, the word observer deliberately to, to, to try and get you to talk about your notion of the observer in the context of the Rulian. Um Generally, I'd just say something. So, so a, a thing um, um, just exists. But if a thing moves, and this speaks exactly to what you were talking about before, it is more than just passively um, assimilating sensory information, sensory samples from the world, and compressing them in some good way, as a good statistician would would, would do, and then just forming the right kind of coarse grained model or compressed model, as people like Jürgen Schmidhuber would it would, would emphasize, or uh, indeed, um, you know, the, the whole um, formulation of efficient communication in terms of minimum message length and minimum description length formulations, you know, the, 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 the kind of universal computation you get to from homograph complexity, all of this is ob about making sense of stuff from the outside coming in. But of course, when you're moving, exactly as you say, you've now got the opportunity to decide what sensory information to go and gather, or you can change your perceived or modeled 
external states in order to deliver different kinds of information. And I think that's that's the twist. That, that's what makes an observer an observer, as opposed to just um, you know a sessile object or a, a passive thing that is not able to actually change the course. Can that act back upon? Um, use the word feedback, and I think that's absolutely crucial. So there's a circular causality here. Certain kinds of things, certain an observer, I think, a true agential observer has the capacity to act upon the thing that's generating the data. And it is in that in that acting that you get the curiosity. And as you say, ignoring uh, and in fact actively avoiding that noisy, ambiguous, potentially boundary destroying, um, dissipative um, part of the universe and sticking to those paths. But in sticking to those paths, because you can't see the paths as they unfold deep into the universe, all you have are the sensory impressions that are local to your local interactions on your sen on your observ you know, your measurement um, uh, tools or your sensory receptors. So you actually have to have a model of what might be going on and where the path might be leading in order. And of course, that's where this resolution of uncertainty, the curiosity comes in that you're taking all the local cues to build a model of where you think the path might be so that you can follow the path. So to come right back to your final thing, what happens if we went too close to a black hole? Could we think our way out of it? I think we possibly could in a sort of um, science fiction sense, simply because we've got the right kinds of models of our lived world, which is just the physics that you're talking about. But lots of other observers would not be able to do that unless they had that right kind of internal model, that implicit um, way of modeling the causes of uh, all of my sensations. Maybe, maybe we should... Maybe we should address that point a little bit. I mean, the, the question of what can be an observer. I mean, I think you were talking about thinginess, so to speak, which is a lower bar probably than observerness. I mean, thinginess might yes. just be yes. the ability to maintain an independent object, maintain something that we can consider to be a persistent object. Yes. I have to say, I think that's a that's a complicated concept right there because let's say we've got an eddy in a fluid, for example. Is well, that a persistent object? Well, it seems that way to us, but at the level of molecules, it's not a persistent object. At the level of molecules, it's different molecules making it up at every moment in time. But Like the great a, red spot on Jupiter, same thing, or the eternal yes. flame, or a hurricane. All these yeah, quite exactly. annoying, vague boundaries. Right, but I mean, but it, it's only to a coarse-graining observer measurer like us, that that thing seems persistent. Yes. To it itself, you know, if, if that thing was, uh, if, if we were molecules, we would say, no, it passed us right by. It's, it's no longer, we're no longer part of that thing. So, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm curious in, um, I mean, uh, so I claim thinginess is, well, I'm, I'm wondering to, to what extent thinginess is the same as observerness. And, you know, to, to identify something as a thing, it needs to be perceived as having certain persistence to whatever is observing it. And also, I suspect it has to be bounded. The, 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 the sort of, the amount of stuff in the thing has to be bounded. In other words, if the thing is the whole universe, you don't get to call it a thing. It's only a thing if it's a limited, you know, if it's a limited part of the whole, so to speak. Um, but I, I guess I'm curious, um, you have this point of view that, it, two things I think that are implicit. One is that an observer-like thing has some kind of free will about what it can do. That is, the the observer can by choice explore this versus that it's not a question of just the vortex is moving through the fluid and the laws of motion make it do this or that thing i mean and i, and I think this is um, so so you're attributing to the thing that you are treating as an observer some degree of possibility of choice and Although maybe maybe not, maybe you're saying that your free energy principle 
is essentially the deterministic physics of what has to happen. And even though the observer may feel that they have a choice, they really ultimately have no choice um, because they're really being you know, led by the nose, so to speak, by this free energy principle to do what they do. And even though they might imagine that they could do something different, they necessarily won't do something different. I mean, I'm, I'm curious what you see as being, I mean, does, does your notion of, I mean, in, are, are you saying that, okay, so, so one point of view would be that what you're describing is kind of a, a law of motion for, for an observer, and that that law of motion, despite the observer feeling that they can choose to do this or that, they really can't any more than, you know, an object moving inertially through space can choose to do this or that. So, like, like for example, you've got a spacecraft, and it's got all kinds of critters inside it, and they're running around and they're saying, we've got to do this and that and the other. But their spacecraft, without any propulsion system, is just going to keep going in this inertial trajectory. Whatever they might, you know, they might run around and, and uh, have all kinds of enthusiasm for things it might do, but it's not going to do them any good. Um, and so you, you might take the point of view that, that it's the same thing with our brains. And I'm, I'm curious whether, whether you do take that point of view. Well, I love that analogy of the, you know, <laughs> the spacecraft with lots of intelligent, sentient critters that can't actually control where they're going. Um, I, again, you, you've picked up, I think, on some key points there. Um, so I would say that to be an observer is to have the kind of agency that you're implying by the, count, the choosing or selecting certain actions to uh, to commit to, actions on the world that will uh, elicit or solicit different kinds of measurements that you can then use, make sen use to make sense of your model of how... Um, the, you know the world works and your place and the way that you couple to that world so i i i'd agree absolutely entirely that there's that there is a bright line between just being a thing being that vortex or um um you know soliton or uh, some something that just persists and um having the kind of agency that allows you to plan and to make moves and i think planning although it's you know not, um perhaps a very intuitive way of describing it actually captures the notion that you actually spoke to which is you know having a choice means that you have counterfactual beliefs in your model about the consequences of your action i think that's quite crucial i think that introduces another bright line between different kinds of things so there are things that just don't act you know there's things possibly like the vortex or a stone things that can't um, couple back and change their environment and then there are things that can move back and change their environment and you could argue this um, massive bodies might uh, might fit, fall into this category by exerting um, say gravitational forces uh, just open brackets I agree the entire things like space and time these are fantasies are hypotheses that only come from this coarse-grained observation of, 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 of the world um, but the, I think the key line between the kind of observer that you and I are and the kind of observations that, say, a thermostat would do is exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's you know, imagining counterfactual futures and very simply articulated mathematically by just um, subsuming one's own actions under the inferred causes of your sensations. So this slightly paradoxically says, well... I can write down mathematically um, this free energy functional of a generative model or a, a joint distribution over causes and consequences, the inside and the outside. Oh, sorry, the other way around, the outside and the inside. And I, I, I can, for certain kinds of uh, systems or things, um, actually include the thing's actions in the causes. So now you've got this um, mathematical image of from the inside of an observer, um, of an observer that has beliefs about what it is doing, which are completely separate from what it's actually doing. Because because it doesn't know what it's doing until it senses the consequences of what it has done. So I think this is this brings you to the, you know, a better description of things that plan. And it's at this point, then you get this information seeking 
ambiguity avoiding. You talked about K, uh, control in control theory. All of these good behaviours just fall out of naturally the kinds of behaviours that you'd expect if you apply uh, literally of, of the variation principle of least action to um, a, a, a probability distribution over not just the external causes of what you're observing, but also your own cause, your, your, your sort of um, auto-poetically expressed causes through through your actual action. And they must be very special kinds of very, very sparsely connected things because they're unaware of their own action. They can't sense their own action. So here's the thing that confuses me. So I, I, I have the impression that you've spent lots of your career trying to understand what happens inside brains. And in a sense, you know, presumably with, you know, at some time in the future, we'll be able to measure every significant feature of the kind of neural firings that happen inside brains. And I'm curious then, when your point of view about counterfactuals and planning and so on, once we can see deterministically this neuron fired, it caused this neuron to fire and so on, how does that relate to your distinction between the stone and the brain? Then you would be looking for empirical evidence. I should say that um, the, there's a slight catch-22 here, because if you, uh, just to come back to a notion you, you were, you were um, referring to earlier on, that there has to be some sort of a finite bound on the number, degrees of freedom that constitute the internal states of an observer, as distinct from the, the channels that are doing the observing or the, the control channels that are, you know, the outputs, as it were, that are... Uh, um, um, mediating the action of, of the observer in terms of gathering her data. So you'd be looking for evidence that the neuronal dynamics were, um, or the internal dynamics had, um, um, could pl uh, plausibly be explained by a gradient flow, uh, you know, a, a dissipative flow on this sort of free energy landscape. And you know what that landscape is if you could find the right generative model or the joint probability distribution that stands in for um, the beliefs about implicit subpersonal mathematical beliefs um, entailed by the structure and the dynamics of the internal states. So in a sense, that's what I do as you know, for my day job. Um, and indeed, I suspect that's what we all do day to day in terms of trying to infer the people's intentionality and states of mind. You know, we're trying to work out what under what kind of structure or belief structure or generative model um, is the you know are these uh, um, behaviors intentions um, understandable if, if I can jump in because I've, I've heard you talk about this before in a slightly different way which is essentially as soon as you're performing a computation that's modeling yourself you know as soon as you have inside your brain a homunculus if you will that's that's able to watch a screen and entertain these counterfactual trajectories that you could or, or may or may not take. It's at that point, once you have that counterfactual depth, I think you referred to it, both a counterfactual and temporal depth to your computation, that it's at that point that you have this agency or the ability to you know, choose, choose actions. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I, and and certainly that would be necessary to be sort of self-aware, to have a minimal kind of selfness, and to know that you are an, you, you are an agent as well. Um, but you, okay. you, you could argue that, that that you could equip a thermostat with you know, a very sophisticated generative model of the consequences of turning the you know a heating element on or off, um, and introduce into that model uncertainty, sensitivity to initial conditions, or some kind of uh, stochastic chaos. And let it plan. You can, um, and indeed we do. We build, you know, sort of artifacts that do have a certain sense of planning. They wouldn't be no. They wouldn't know they were agents, but they they would have a certain kind of agency that would elude any potential um, proactive or uh, anticipatory dynamics that you might find in a stone. So you're looking for um, you're looking for sort of um, conservative dynamics, you know, divergence-free dynamics that have a certain kind of itinerancy. Um, that you know normally expresses itself in terms of oscillations and life cycles, or um, you know respiratory cycles, or you know, and the like. So you're looking for an itinerant kind of dynamics that has the 
requisite variety, you know, deliberately using Ross Ashby's um, words, that has the internal degrees of freedom to be a good enough model of the controllable aspects and the you know, the the um, the modelled world, which is you know the internal the um, the stone or the uh, the brain is actually using to act upon the world uh, and plan to act upon the world. So I mean I think this is an important potential distinction, but I think it's more complicated than this. Is my my intuition. So I mean let, let's take you know considering our venue here of machine learning street talk. Let's talk about AIs. <laughs> um, you know, we've got, you know, we've got some artificial neural net. It's, uh, you know, an LLM is a fairly simple, has a fairly simple kind of flow of information. But imagine that we have some, some neural net. Imagine that we have taken our brains and, you know, we've been so successful at neuro imaging of some kind or whatever it is that we can really pretty much map our brains onto the, the bit patterns of artificial neural nets. Now my question is, I'm looking at this bit pattern and I'm asking myself, does this bit pattern have a model of itself? And one of the things that I think is difficult in that is that any universal computer is capable in some sense of having a model of itself. Because any universal computer is capable of emulating any kind of computational device, including in particular the, the very computer that is doing the emulating. So I, I'm curious if, if, if you're presented with, you know, the bit pattern comes from, you know, sophisticated imaging of brains or whatever, or it comes from an artificial neural net, what is the, what is the thing that you put that into to make a decision? And, and, and you can't, I think, consider, you know, all of us have an internal feeling of how we think things work and how we think we work. But we can't even, other than by extrapolation, we can't even be sure that other people, other different human minds, have the same point of view about what's going on. And so I'm curious from the outside, from a kind of pure you know, data science point of view, I've got this bag of bits and it's doing certain things. How do I tell whether this bag of bits is meeting your criterion of having sort of a counterfactual planning model of the world. Right. Um, so much like um, the empirical problem and indeed the hard problem of consciousness, you can't. Um, the whole point of the persistence that we were talking about before read as um, the persistence of, of the boundary or the Markov blanket means you will never know observing something what's going on behind the Markov blanket. It's unknowable because if it were knowable or measurable, you'd have to destroy the Markov blanket and the thing in and of itself would not exist. Uh, and certainly if you think wait, about wait it- a minute, Wait a minute, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not assuming that, I, let, let's, take, let's take the case that in an artificial neural net, we can look at every bit. We, we don't happen to be yet technologically able to do that for brains. But we can imagine, I think, a time in which we can non-destructively look at every bit of what's going on in the brain. And then the question is, we're seeing this complicated bit pattern. We're seeing it in an artificial neural net, which is easy to measure. We're seeing it in a brain, which happens to be technologically hard to measure right now. And then we're asking the question, is this pattern of bits that we're seeing an example of something which is a plausible sort of self-reflecting or you know, counterfactual generating, modeling the world internally kind of thing, or is it just a bag of bits that follow certain rules? Well, I, I mean, I think I think my answer would be the same that you will you will never know. You you, you but you could certainly infer that. I mean, you, I'm smiling because you're you're just describing my day job again. <laughs> so my entire life has been built around. Um, getting beneath the blanket and using things like brain imaging, usually non-invasive, um, but sometimes invasive when you have to implant electrodes, you have, say, for deep brain stimulation, like, um, and and measuring the internal dynamics, the bits, the patterns, and the you know the the, the computational architectures implicit in the in the wiring and the and and the um, the neuroanatomy and the connectome, um, and then making a best guess and trying to infer 
is this the kind of message passing or pattern or updating or dynamics or architecture that could be explained in terms of a um, evidence maximizing, free energy minimizing, belief updating process under some kind of generative model? And if so, what kind of generative model is? You know, we can get quite a long way with that. I mean, one of my favorite examples is um, you know, brains like ours have um, dis in, uh, distilled a fundamental conditional independence between whatness and awareness into their anatomy. So you know, the top half of the brain does all the awareness and does all the uh, the space or metric space, you know, specific pointing activity or looking activity, whereas the bottom streams of the, um, in this instance, the uh, inferior temporal lobe or the temporal lobe are much more concerned with the whatness of things. And so, that, you know, there, there are certain um, an, uh, architectural features of both the dynamics and the, the, the connectivity, the sparsity, the coupling that we were just talking about before, which give you strong clues as to the kind of generative model. Ah, oh, this kind of person, this kind of artifact clearly has a generative model in which her lived world entails things that are objects that might exist, but knowing what something is doesn't tell you where it is and vice versa. And immediately you think, well, that's very consistent with my lived world, it, this metric world full of object, you know, physical or visual objects um, that can be in different places. Speaking to your, you know, very interesting example before about, um, you know, if I move something, is it the same thing? Well, no, it's clearly not the same thing. But, you know, if you can sort of coarse grain and factorize the world into whatness and awareness and have some equivalence or equivalence so well actually this is like the same whatness but just now in a different awareness so you've partitioned statistically in your model and the physical instantiation of that model that um that sort of um statistical regularity that thing that persists even if the molecules of the object don't persist but the regularity the pattern the coarse grained explanation for for, for for the sensory impressions generated by that thing you put that into the anatomy so you, you you pursue that. So what would you be looking for if you've got some kind of agent that has beliefs about the future and then beliefs about itself having beliefs about the future, which I think is what you're in, implying um, by the self-modeling. And you'd be looking for a hierarchical structure. You'd be looking for um, certain um, Markov blankets or conditional independences instantiated in the absence of literally neuronal connections or wires on a bus, literally um, a sparse coupling that had a hierarchical aspect. And, and then you'd be looking for the the correlates of the message passing, the, the amount of electricity used for beyond that particular risk. Uh, so, so your view is that it's kind of a, a series of the watcher watching the watcher watching the watcher type thing. And that in some sense, I mean, perhaps your view is that sort of the the higher cognitive function is literally a you know a series of hierarchical levels where you're sort of progressively abstracting from the world that is at some lowest level you've got the world as it is and all those neuron you know all those photons coming in all those neuron firings happening at the first level and then that you're somehow progressively abstracting compressing reducing that to eventually come to presumably you know to the to the point where you make a decision should i do this or should i do that lots of lots of sensory input has come in and you're kind of filtering it down so i'm curious if if you look at at uh, you know other animals not humans um do you imagine that it's the same kind of i mean i mean it's, it's an interesting and and quite uh, uh kind of I, I would say sort of it's a it's a very definite view of of what it means to be a thinking thing would be that you're always taking all the details of the world and always trying to crush it down to the point where you make a decision about what to do next. And that that would be a thing where you could imagine uh, observing that there's all that compression happening to decide what to do next. Now, I, I will say that I don't think that's specific to brains. I mean, imagine that you've got a rock. It's perched on some you know, uh, a hilltop or something. And lots of things happen to the rock. There's rain, there's wind, there's all kinds of things. And eventually one day, the rock starts rolling down the hill. In other words, from all of those detailed, from all those details about what the rocks, the environment that the rock was exposed to, eventually it makes a definitive decision. And I, I'm, I'm curious what the distinction is between 
that kind of sort of many things happen and, you know, the many things have to take place. You know, the rock is eroded away and this happens and that happens and it's a whole hierarchy of actions and then eventually one day the rock rolls down the hill. Mm-hmm. So how would you distinguish that from, from uh, kind of your view of kind of the, uh, uh, the sort of hierarchy of action in brains? I mean, other than that in that particular case, the time scale might be years in the case of the rock and the time scale for brains might be seconds or something. Yes, well, that's a, that's a great question, a great challenge. Um, so, but just to pick up on that that notion of 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 time scale, um, as soon as you have a hierarchical um, message passing scheme or dynamics or, or or physics of the kind that, that I think we're talking about here, there's a separation of time scales as you get hierarchically more abstract or deeper, if you like, um, into your observer. Um, so, part of the hierarchy will almost inevitably entail. A, um, the kind of temporal persistence that you spoke about earlier in terms of the observer in reading her world as things that endure over time, including me, uh, including our, your, ourselves. Um, that is a gift of the, the dynamics that usually supervene at the deepest uh, hierarchical levels of any, you know, imagine, say, centripetal c- c- kind of hierarchy. So I think that's an important observation that you know, you can't sort of commit to a single time frame to understand the contextualization of fast moving high dimensional content in the course of the coarse graining that there's also a coarse graining over time which we call context for example um so that would be one important aspect when uh, trying to understand um could you call a rock eventually being knocked from its perch as a decision I would say probably not because you haven't got the you know the sort of the, you know the, the scale invariant over time. Um, it's certainly an event, but you'd hardly call it an you know you could hardly um, call this uh, any kind of something that it persists over time. You know, from my point of view, it certainly would not be an expression of a, a pullback attractor. If the rock, however, um, fell down the hill and started walking back up again, that kind of behaviour would suggest to me ah there's something going on of interest under the hood. And I, when I cracked the rock, I'd expect to see some hierarchical architecture and some itinerant dynamics that would support that kind of separation separation of temporal scales. But before I sliced open the rock or put you in a brain imager, I wouldn't know. You know, I just have to guess based upon your behaviour, your your active states, or your your, your the, the 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 boundary that separates what's going on in, in your inside from, from from me as part of your your outside. Right, but I mean, the problem is, this is uh, the, well, well, we'll never know, is a reasonable thing to say. On the other hand, if one's trying to make a distinction between observer-like things, well, this, there's a couple of levels of distinction here. There's the distinction between just everything and things, and then things and observer-like things. And I think the, um, um, and I think, Several of these distinctions are kind of complicated, and I'm, 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 you know, in order to have something which seems like a, a kind of a, a, a scientifically progressing kind of set of ideas, it seems like one really has to be able to make a, a definite distinction between sort of the, uh, you know, how do I tell from the bag of bits that I have. A, an observer-like thing as opposed to just a thing. And to, to kind of make that a bit more technological, uh, you know, we've got all these AI systems and we've got everybody talking about whatever they might mean by AGI, which I think is a kind of foolish concept, but that's a different issue. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, should one imagine that uh, the to make a more sort of human agency-like AI, that we necessarily have to have some notion of hierarchy. I mean, you know, in, in your average LLM, there is, in a sense, one level of hierarchy in the sense there's the feed forward of what the LLM does when it reach, you know, when it uh, tries to figure out the next token. And there's the kind of, you know, big feedback loop of, uh, you know, seeing the previous tokens and then deciding what to, and, and then uh, uh, sort of iterating uh, to 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 figure out what the next token should be. So I'm curious whether you see whether you think that uh, 
it's sort of a fundamental idea of the way that things like us work, that there's a deeper hierarchy. And if you think that that has implications for sort of the technology of AI. Yes, I, I do. I'm very aware you, you're being very courteous. You're asking me questions all, all the time, which is uh, very generous of you. Uh, but yes, I, I, I think that 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 hierarchical structure. That I, I'm sorry. Structure. I'm just. A, you see, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to live some version of your principle or not, as the case <laughs> may be. That I'm I'm doing a, a you know, yeah, but, seeking the unknown type thing. Yeah, but uh, Keith and I. Please Keith, go ahead. Well, Keith and Tim promised me I'd learn all about the Rulyard, which I I, I would <laughs> I would like to. We won't have time now, but I would like to have pressed you on that because uh, yeah, oh, I find please, that quite quite, no. quite intriguing. Um, but we've we've now gone into um, um, sort of uh, you know large language models and the kind of dynamics. I think I think that's absolutely right. I think I, you know, I if I want let me put it this way: if I knew what the generative model was, I could actually just simulate belief updating under that generative model. I could basically just integrate under the path, the, you know, the principle of least action a free energy minimizing device, and it would look as if it was behaving intentionally and planning and in a base optimal way it would also do a uh, base optimal kl control it would do everything you wanted if i could write down the generative model but to write down the generative model i have to know exactly what kind of world what kind of user what kind of ecosystem is this particular computer designed for um, and furthermore i'd have to be able to explain it you know so immediately you've got if you give me a computer uh, if you give me a, a, a you know a piece of artificial intelligence that is completely explainable and by which i mean you can write down the generative model and i will understand it then yes i could tell you exactly this is a stone this is self-aware this is not self-aware but it has a, a you know it still has a kind of agency of a uh, perspective sort this thing's like a thermostat uh this thing you know uh, but but wait a minute w once you say you have a model that says everything about what it does the thing has no chance to have something that anybody would consider to be something like free will because you're basically saying you're 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 stipulating that the thing is just acts in a predictable way yeah so i think I guess the, maybe uh, i'm gonna jump in here and say i don't i don't think you need free will in order to have agency so I think if I, even if I had a machine that was taking in inputs and conducting an analysis and as a result of that analysis deciding to raise a red flag or, you know, walk uh -huh. up a hill, I still think that's agency, even if Tell it was Tell me what you mean by agency. What yeah, do you so mean what I mean agency? by that is, is literally that it's performing a computation about sensory inputs and as a result of that computation deciding some, some output. But so any old classifier, any old machine learning classifier does that. Does well, it have except agency? it's not performing it's not performing an, an action though, right? It's but it just, could be. If you connect it to a robot or something, it can perform yep. plenty of actions. And as I soon mean, as like, you do, like, then it then it becomes an then it becomes an agent, you know, acting acting in the world. Okay, so I so I mean the, the the you know, image identifying cat flap that decides is it a cat or not, that cat flap has agency. In your I would I would say it does. It has a very simple form of agency, but I think that that's so. So your definition, definition of agency is that there is there are a large number of possible inputs. You are sort of you know whittling that down to something about which a decision can be made, and then you are actuating in the world, perhaps. So, for example, does it have agency in some, in some environment? Yeah. Okay. Does it have agency if the only thing it does is to change a bit? somewhere inside itself. In other words, that bit might be the bit that is on some IO bus that causes it to actuate the cat flap. But that bit might be, at the beginning, just an internal bit inside, in a sense, the brain of the AI. So how would you distinguish yeah. those two things? You say it has to have that flow out to the outside world in order to be validly an agent or to have agency. Or can it have agency with respect to, so, so for example, can there be a notion of agency if the end result of your thinking is that you think a particular thought? Is that enough? Yep. Or does agency require actuation in the real world? Yeah, so I think uh, the, way I, the way I would frame it, and look, this is, 
to, to both of you to, uh, to criticize it or not. But the way I would frame it is if I'm affecting a change in the same environment that I'm perceiving, then I'm an agent. So it's like if I'm, if I'm taking in inputs from environment A, okay, and then affecting a change in environment B and A and B are totally decoupled, then I wouldn't call that thing an agent. That's something like a bridge between two different, two different environments. But as soon as I can enact changes in the same environment that I'm perceiving, I think that that's ordinarily what a, what a person would perceive as being an agent. You know, it could that, be very that, simple. That you know, a roach, that, a roach is an agent. You know, maybe it has that, a very simple neural circuitry. But that assumes that there's sort of an external environment. And I guess this relates yep. to the whole Markov blanket business of whether you can distinguish the outside environment sparsely connected to your internal states or whether right. you are, you're merely affecting. So, so you're saying if you've got agency, so let me see if I understand this. There's sort of a sparse connection from the outside world coming in. And that is, you know, there's a lot of detail in the outside world. There are sparse connections coming into you and you're saying you have agency if you can back propagate, so to speak, not in the sense of back propagation, but if you can if you can go back out through those sparse connections to affect that big complicated outside world, then you say you have agency. That it requires this sort of two-way thing that you're both bringing it in through that sparse connection and pushing it out through the sparse connection. Is that, is that correct, Carl? I'm curious whether that's whether you would agree, disagree, change that um, that that definition. I, I, I was just relaxing, seeing the exchange. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think you'd have to acknowledge that, that there's, a, I think, two distinct use of the words agency. Uh, you, know, um, I, you know, I can certainly um, argue for, for, um, for Keith's position that simply being able to couple back and complete that sort of circular causality if i was a uh, you know uh, 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 talking to neurobiologists this would be the action perception cycle just being able to act upon the world is one very simple definition of an agent and that uh, in that view a thermostat would be would be uh, you know, a kind of agent but the other the other sense i think we, we, we've been using it as in a slightly more nuanced sense which is the um, the ability to actively select a particular course of action uh, from a number of counterfactual alternatives. Um, that requires a much more expressive kind of generative model. So, you know, I, I, I think that I'm not sure whether they're bright lines. Um, you could argue that they're sort of vague or graded distinctions. Would, one way of thinking about this is how far into the future do you take your planning? So if I'm a thermostat, I can just do that on sort of, you know, first and second temporal derivatives. I can sort of, you know, like a common filter. Or, oh, sorry, um, like the kind of linear quadratic control that you would get if you yeah, interpret the com control or something. PID, yeah. perfect. Mm -hmm. Just a, a, a few derivatives uh, in the moment. Um, that will give me um, the kind of agency that, that, that is very reflexive and autonomic and uh, automatic and the kind of thing that we, you know, you could that could in principle be found in autopilots and thermostats and you know many things that we use around the house um you could argue that just by having those um those um state estimates and their higher derivatives that there is a sort of future pointing aspect because you can just sort of project out the path you know you lose uncertainty very quickly but you can certainly sort of think of those um those higher derivatives of say the coefficients of a Taylor expansion of little path into the future but so think you know what uh, you know at what point though do you do you, do you go into the future uh, sufficiently far that you can call it a plan so at what point and perhaps it, there isn't a, a hard answer perhaps it's just a graded it's just a, a question of how tall are you how deep is your temporal horizon um and how you know deep can you infer it given this anatomy given the structure of the thermostat and the or the um the time rollouts in a you know in, in, in say a, you know, All right. a very so, so i'm curious if, if you've got your average ai llm whatever else and i go and i can probe that system what do i look for to look for planning and counterfactual the construction of counterfactuals in other words i've got i've i've read out a trillion bits from my LLM in action, how can I tell if it's thinking counterfactually? Right. First of all, you could just you know, do do what a, a, any life scientist will do, which is basically either kill it and dissect it and, and look at it, look at its anatomy, or ping it in some way and try to infer its causal architecture, 
or let it run uh, in its natural environment and then look at for correlations measuring the functional connect you know the do structural equation model or or, or right but i mean in, in the case of an LLM, you know yeah. it's just a bag of bits on my computer sure. i know yeah. what every bit is there's no sort of you know inference by no complicated inference i know the bits the question is even given those bits you know at the lowest level of bits i know what it is if you ask me at a at a coarser level what is it thinking for example yeah. i probably don't have a clue because i don't have a way to uh you know i don't have an in, you know it, it seems like one of the key problems of neuroscience we don't have a way to describe and perhaps this is what you're you're working uh, towards you know we don't have a way to describe how brains work at an intermediate level between kind of the neuron firings and the words that get spoken by the brain type thing in other words that that um, um and so in the case of you know the ai the llm whatever else i'm curious because that's a case where we don't have any limitation on the underlying data we know what every bit is and so now my question is can i run what test would i run what kind of correlation would i measure what kind of what, what would i do to say hey you're a counterfactually thinking ai and this one over here you know you could have a, a counterfactuality index or something for different llms of right. how counterfactually can they think how would you measure that I, I, i'm sorry i keep on asking questions but i'm just i'm so curious um, well i don't know if this is related carl but i know you had a, a recent nature paper i believe that was about rat cortical neurons where you know there was there was some quantitative analysis by which you determined that it was performing you know bayesian um, or active inference so i don't know if it's it's related in how you quantified that but that could be a an avenue that, that's very smart of you because i was actually just thinking about should i introduce that as an example of how you practically do this you basically reverse engineer the generative model that could account for this these bits and the anatomy upon which these bits play that's a very difficult game, ah. though, unless you've got very, very, basically what you're well, okay, saying. So, is... so essentially, what you're saying there is there is an underlying thing that the LLM or whatever does, and you know all its bits. Yeah. Now you try and yourself construct another model, like you might use another LLM yes. to yeah. try to construct a model for the first LLM. That is explainable. The question, it has to be explainable. That, that's the, you know, the other, I think the other, once the it's explainable. Yeah, right. I mean, the, the, the problem is, I, I understand that science tends to be about making an explainable narrative for how things work in the world. The problem is, I think that that's at odds with some of the things that you will need to have something where you can genuinely say that has a model of itself. Because I think that to have, in a, in a sense, the itself is doing things which are not explainable at that level. If everything that we did was fully explainable, I don't think we would ever consider ourselves to, for example, have choice or free will. I see. In other words, if we could always I, explain... I don't think it has to be fully explainable, though, because there is, there is the uncertainty baked into at least the free energy principle. So if I have a generative model of my own actions in the world, there's quite a bit of uncertainty. And so I'm computationally bounded. Maybe I carve off 20% of my computational resources to that to that activity, but it's not going to be a, it won't have perfect fidelity. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so then the question then that, that I would ask is, okay, you're saying that even though it's not going to get it right all the time, you're saying that, that even getting it right some of the time is, and having kind of a, a self model that is an approximation. See, cause, cause you know, a very simple approximation is just to say it's going to generate another token. That's a very coarse approximation. You're saying you want a finer approximation, but not so fine an approximation that you really actually capture all of the dynamics. It's some intermediate level of sort of coarse-grained approximation that is sort of, uh, uh, you know, good enough, but not too good. I, I mean, I, I do think these distinctions are, uh, I mean, I think some of these distinctions are sort of core to the notion of what observers like us can be like. And I think it's interesting to try to home in on, you know, just what is the right level here? Because I, I, my own guess is that some of what we perceive about the universe, so let me give an extreme example. It'll be interesting to figure out 
whether the fact that we perceive space to be roughly three-dimensional is a consequence of some aspect of us as observers. It's not obvious to me. I think it's possible that that's the case. And in other words, that, that we could perfectly well describe the universe as being one-dimensional, where you know, we have to chase along all these worms that sort of you know, navigate through space, so to speak. There's sort of space filling curves arranged through space. But that would be a very weird and inefficient way for us, for observers like us, to describe the universe. And so my, my you know, this is why I'm curious about kind of what is the nature of observers? Because I think that the nature of observers, once we understand it better, we're going to say, why do we see the universe the way we see it? And the answer is going to be because we happen to be observers like we are. Just as we can say, why do we see the night sky that we see? Well, it's because we happen to be at this particular place in this particular galaxy and so on. So, well, I mean, this, that, and this, you know, this go maybe ahead. in the spirit of asking you a bit about the rule uh, is Please, that, go ahead. And I think this links back because you asked a couple times, you know, can you imagine a universe in which it's just not possible for there to be persistent observers like us that are able to survive because there's not enough, you know, predictability. And I kept thinking you might be in a very good position to answer that question because one takeaway I took from a lot of your work on computation and the cellular automaton, really a new kind of science, is that, look, of all the possible calculations out there, most of them are pretty boring. They're either very random or just some boring, you know, line that goes on forever. There's this tiny, tiny sliver of computations that have this this chaos, this this advanced nonlinear kind of complexity. You know, so I'm curious when you're when you're building the Ruliad and you start off with some type of substrate, some type of hypergraph, and there's a set of rules from which, you know, the laws of physics emerge, you know, how much fine tuning has to go in there? Like of all the possible rules, um, which what percentage? Is it a small sliver that produce interesting behavior? And what's your intuition tell you about of that sliver that produces interesting behavior, what fraction of that would allow for observers like us? Right. Well, so everything happens in the Ruliad. So it's not, we don't get to choose or fine tune anything about the Ruliad itself. What we do get to choose and fine tune is what part of it we are sampling. Now, when I say choose, it's like, there is an entity that is sampling every possible part of it, but an entity like us is that the, there are aspects of what's going on that we sample. Now, when you say things that are interesting, that's a deeply sort of human centric thing to say, because what's interesting to us is a certain set of things that, well, what's interesting to us is what's interesting to us. I don't think there's a try as we might with, I don't know, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, information theoretic, you know, algorithmic information theoretic, you know, all of these things, in the end, I think, devolve into, well, it depends on how you do the coarse graining, it depends on what you think the underlying generative model is, etc, etc, etc. And all that reflects right back on us. In other words, I don't think there's an absolute notion of what's, you know, what's interesting and what's not. You know, when you talk about compression, for example, this question of compression, uh, at least, is, is always, it's like it's a question of, well, what's the machine that is doing the decompression? If you say, you know, you can have, if, if you're doing something like, you know, traditional, you know, Shannon style information theory, you're, you're usually using things like block coding and so on, where it's a very definite, simple model of what the compression and decompression process can be. It's um, so I, I think you know I, I think this question of what's interesting, it turns right back on us. I don't think there's an absolute answer to that. And you know when you ask, well, what about all the all the alien intelligences that aren't like us? Well, most of those alien intelligences will be so different from us that we won't recognize them. We won't you know our AIs are perhaps our first really good example of an alien intelligence that, by design, we arrange to be quite aligned with us. I mean, we don't even get that for, 
your average whale or something. We don't know how, you know, we can't really understand its intelligence because it wasn't built to be aligned with us, so to speak. Our AIs are built to be aligned with us. So we get to have a much more sort of, I think, you know, it's much more plausible to have sort of a, a, a communication with that sort of human aligned intelligence or human aligned kind of uh, 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 set, set of things that are going on. That there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff to discuss, but unfortunately, I, I am quite running out of time here. So, so uh, even though I, this seems very unfair because I've, I've been, been um, uh, asking. Would you like to come back for a round 2.0 where, where we uh, commit, <laughs> uh, we commit at, to at exploring point, more about should, the role yes. yet? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I, I'd be, um, but, but maybe, I mean, if, if we have just a, a moment more, I mean, uh, Carl, if you, if you uh, it sounded like you had sort of a pent up uh, set of questions here, and I, I'd be um, uh, um, maybe at least a preview of the of the pent up questions or something would be would be interesting. Okay, very briefly, because uh, uh, um, I appreciate you've got the rest of your day to to to, to live out in uh, California, which is where I presume you are. Um, no, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm in I'm in the East Coast actually, so I'm oh, right. three oh, hours. Right. Okay. But, but um, I'm a, but I'm a late scheduled guy, so. So yeah, I, was just, I was just really interested in um, you know listening to 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 you um, talk about the Ruliad and thinking about us as observers as part or a slice or a slither of of this. Um, whether there will be any mileage in using the notion um, of bounded computation read as a, uh, a Markov boundary or a Markov blanket based upon the implicit, what I imagine is some kind of um, adjacency matrix that inherits from the, the sort of hypographical construction of the Rouliard. So I, I was just wondering if there's any way of, of sort of um, thinking about identifying certain patterns that do the sort of diverging and merging again and therefore give the impression at a certain degree of coarse graining of persistence in the in the sense of there being a, a you know like a pullback attractor or an attracting set of arrangements and that that could be operationally defined with a markov blanket which is trivial to do once you've got the adjacency matrix you can easily identify the markov blanket of any given set of states and then you could call those an observer so i just wanted to know whether that real simple, really simply simple-minded view of the Rouliad as basically being whose anatomy was described by some neighborhood relationships at a very very small yeah. scale um, was was an apt a starting point for understanding the nature of the Rouliad. Right, right, right. So I mean, essentially, what you're saying is, can you separate off things, objects? that have sort of sparse connection to other parts of the system. Yes. It's unfortunately more complicated than that. Okay, oh. so an example of something where you can separate off aspects of it are black holes, where, because what makes even the structure of space is there isn't any notion of space until you have activity in space. So you're building up this causal graph of all the different events that are happening and in order to even have a notion of space, you need a kind of kind of whole ocean of those events. That, that, that's, that's what makes space. So in a sense, there is necessarily connection of some kind between everything in space by virtue of those many events having happened. The only place where you can sort of separate that off is when you have an event horizon and where you can sort of say, no, there's really no dependence from this to that, or at least no dependence uh, when you when you're not dealing with multi-way systems and quantum mechanics and so on, um, so I, I I don't think it's quite as simple as that. I mean, is there a way to kind of understand the statistics of the Rouliad and ask not whether there is any correlation? There certainly is a correlation because otherwise space wouldn't hang together. But whether there is a significant correlation, a correlation at some coarse-grained level, I think that's what you have to go for. And that's, again, just technically vastly more complicated because you have to define what's a useful coarse graining procedure. The very definition of what a useful coarse graining procedure is is going to lead you into questions of observers. And so I, I don't think it's, a, it's, it's a, a vastly more complicated, at a technical level, it's a vastly more complicated kind of question. But it's a, I think that's a very reasonable thing to 
to be going for, it just isn't easy to achieve, except in these rather straightforward, very space-time oriented cases like event horizons. But I think that that's, uh, you know, I, I would love to have a, a good characterization of, you know, I've got a piece of Rouliad and I can view this piece as being an observer-like piece as opposed to another yes. piece. Yes. That would be a lovely thing to be able to do. Um, yes. I don't know how to do that. And in a sense, in a sense, that was what I was pushing you on. But the difference between a, a you know a rock and a brain um, is uh, uh, is asking for that same kind of thing. Um, I think it is yet more difficult in the case of Rouliad, just because it builds up everything, and so you you, you kind of you don't get so, so so one of the things to understand, and this relates to thinginess and markup blankets and so on, perhaps, is this notion that is very critical to science, as we have as we've pursued science so far, that you can have isolated things in the world, that you can have an experiment you do where you say this is an experiment, it's on this thing, and nothing else in the world affects the thing I'm looking at. That's a you know that notion of of factorizability about the world is something that I think, and I think that's what you're going for with this kind of Markov blanket idea, if I'm understanding correctly, and. That notion of factorizability, I think in some fundamental sense, what the Rouliad tells us is there isn't ultimate factorizability. There never will be. The only question is, for the things that we choose to look at, is there some effective theory that we can think of as factorizable, it's a, at least enough that we can have sort of definite thoughts without always being affected by other things in, in, that happen in the world? And I, you know, I, I've, um, well, it's interesting. More, more to think about here. I, I like your, um, uh, I think this notion of um, observers who kind of actively pick for themselves the path of predictability, I think is interesting. I, I, I still feel like I need to untangle that idea a little bit more. I, I feel like there's a, there's a bit more, and you've kind of indicated that you see there as, as being some tautological character to it. I, I, I kind of feel like it has a, a, um, uh, I, I would suspect that there is something which you are, something interesting which you're effectively taking as axiomatic about observers, and and perhaps perhaps some um, uh, that uh, I mean, in a sense, one of the things I'm trying to do right now is to think about what aspects of observers are in fact there, but we've always thought they were obvious. In other words, the idea that there could be pure motion. You know, that's always seemed completely self-evident and obvious, but yet I think it's something one has to derive. And so I'm sort of curious about as you peel back, you know, what things are there about observers that have always seemed totally obvious to us, but in fact, it might not be that way, and, and trying to understand that. Um, and that's, uh, well, that's kind before, of the, yeah, before you can have pure emotion, I guess you even have to have a thing that, that's moving, right? And it sounds like in the context of the Rouliad, do we even have a, a mechanism of identifying persistent things or not? I mean, is there well, a... Is, yeah, it's a bit coarse right now. I mean, we can identify things like black holes because they have a very definite structure in their causal graphs. Right. To identify things like electrons is something we are not yet able to do. Although I have a, this very strong suspicion that, which was even really highlighted by this video that, that we just made, um, electrons and black holes are not that different, I think. Even though so this that's, has been a very popular idea for a long time, right? The, the black hole electron, there's so many similarities between, between an electron and black holes. I, I, I think people have told me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering when I was like, 15 years old or something, maybe 14 years old or something, I went to some talk by some well-known physicist uh, and, you know, I, I sort of said, well, you know, they were talking about black holes and I was like, is there something, you know, similar between electrons and black holes? And it was like, no, 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 that's a completely silly idea. You know, you should forget that idea. Um, there's, so, but, there's so much that's similar and then there's just a little bit that's off, right? It's like not quite doesn't quite match. Well, you know? I think the thing that I really enjoy is the concept of why is that why are all electrons why do they all seem the same? And a black hole, you know, your average black hole, all the different black holes in the universe, we imagine they were made from the crushing of completely different stars. 
but to the outside of the black hole, they look the same. And so that leads one to the kind of amusing idea that all those electrons, all those 10 to the 80th electrons that there are in our universe that seem to all be the same, maybe actually each of those individual electrons has sort of a crushed civilization inside it that's different, but to the outside of the electron, they look the same. And that's, uh, and now, and now we have to start talking about those, uh, to the, you know, those observers that live inside the crushed civilization inside the electron, how do they feel about sort of, uh, how, how do they, um, uh, how do they kind of, uh, uh, conduct their lives, so to speak, and um, are they like those uh, those creatures we were talking about earlier inside the inertially moving spacecraft, who are who are like uh, having this whole, you know, they're having a whole giant, um, uh, you know, that they're, they're giving lots of speeches all inside the electron, but nothing outside the electron can tell that there's that there's anything going on there. Um, well, so just real real last quick, and Carl, I'm sorry for taking the time here, but for the for the the black holes, which you can identify in the Ruliad, are they able to experience pure emotion? Well, ha, to observers who have certain characteristics, they will appear to have pure emotion. But for okay. example, the knitting together, uh, one of the things that actually is pretty tricky, it was even tricky in making this video, which is kind of an interesting thing, is in order to make the video, we had to have we had to, it took more effort to constrain the observer than to work out the underlying dynamics. In other words, to, to, to render the video required aligning the sort of different pieces of space at different moments of time and keeping those coherent. And that took vastly more computational effort than it took to do the underlying dynamics of, of what was going on. And so that's, that's kind of highlights the fact that you know, we had to make an assumption about the observer. The observer thinks they're standing still. The observer is not zipping around all over the place. The observer believes they're stuck. They're persistent in time and they're stuck in more or less the same place in space. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to make a video that anybody recognizes, even though the underlying connections in, the, in all these hypergraphs are, are all absolutely correct. We just wouldn't be able to see that. So it, it's a, um, so in that sense, uh, you know, we can say that to an observer with those characteristics, yes, black holes are persistent things. Um, and, and those characteristics, by the way, this is all reflected in, in, the, in the traditional tr treatment of general relativity. There are, uh, it is, you know, the, the, this business about aligning things is, if you don't do that, even in standard numerical relativity, you end up with all these weird coordinate singularities that kind of, that kind of shred your space. Um, so anyway, that this is uh, uh, so it's it's kind of fun that we get to see even in just we're trying to make a video. It kind of forces us to think about these scientific questions about what how observers work and how much effort it is to be an observer. How much effort it is to kind of successfully knit together, you know, these these things that that sort of are happening underneath in the universe. Um, well, anyway, th th this I, I, has been. Uh, I I have to run off here. I I don't want to, but I, yeah. I I'd love to go on and and uh, and chat some more. But I I see I'm actually two meetings late, so uh, I think I have to go back let to me, my let day me, job. Oh, um, Keith, maybe just before we wrap up, could you recapitulate some of what we were discussing earlier, which is similar to what you just said now? And I I don't want to say that you are an agency chauvinist, but you were just saying that there might be one particular way of demonstrating agency and earlier on you were saying oh, okay well we should look at the overall system and there is a distribution of agency it, it's it's it has loci all over the system and you could draw a big boundary and say well that thing's has agency but you could be much more efficient and you right. could draw a smaller boundary and that smaller boundary would have almost all of the agency of the big boundary because most of the things in the big boundary are just mimicking or stealing agency from things in the small boundary so Keith you were saying it's really important for us to encapsulate the most agency possible which is to say the most amount of t uh, temporal planning in the smallest space yeah and so what I had in mind there Carl was just that imagine imagine I'm, I'm a pilot steering a ship Okay, and if somebody looking from the outside looked at the ship, they may decide that the ship as a whole is an agent. You know, it's planning. Like, obviously, it's planning. It navigated through, you know, the Suez Canal and some locks and whatever else. But 
but there's a smaller subsystem. If we had the ability to analyze this, we could find a smaller subsystem, which is the pilot, you know, this human being who's sitting at the controls, who's actually the the agent, right? And maybe you could shrink it down a bit further and say it's really just all his, his brain. It's everything inside of his skull that's kind of doing the planning. But then we realize that agency actually has the two sides of the coin. Like it has the planning side of the coin, which is only happening up in here. But the inaction side is perhaps different because if you're looking at the all the machinery necessary to enact the plan, it's the pilot's brain and the pilot's body and the ship itself and all its components. So I think you, you know, you can come up with a different boundary if you look at the inactive piece of agency versus the planning piece of agency. But I think you do need to, on the planning side, you need to at least shrink it down to that minimal system that contains the, the actual planning.